All right. Good morning, Powersville. Good morning. Thankful to be here. Thankful to be worshiping with you. I was kind of reflecting on this first song that we're about to sing. For some of you, it'll be old. For some of you, it'll be new. But it's all a song about praise. I don't know if you grew up in a house where there was lots of praise or if you grew up in a house where there was little or none. But I think there's something beautiful about praise that's both good for the giver and good for the person that receives it. I was thinking about the Olympics. I know many of you have been following the Olympics. And, you know, imagine if they didn't do the podiums. Imagine if they didn't do the gold medals. It seemed a little weird, right? That there was no, like, thankfulness in what happened at the end. Everybody just kind of went home after, after uh, no closing ceremony, no, no meddling at all. Because there's something that is, uh, again, good for us and good for the people that receive it. Uh, about praise, and so this morning we're gonna we're gonna sing um, this first song as about praise. I was reminded that uh, one time Jesus was walking with his disciples, and some some of the Pharisees came to him and said, "Hey, tell them to stop saying these nice things about. Tell them to stop doing that." And he said, "I'll tell you, even if these disciples were silent, the very stones would cry out. Like it's just right and good." That we would say thank you to God, that we would remember. So I hope that some of this is just really meaningful to you, that you get to say things that are uh, meaningful to the Lord, that you would express those, but also things that would be good for your soul and for my soul to say out loud together. So would you stand? Let's sing this together. <laughs> Quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep? 
moment here to say hello, give a handshake, a hug, and welcome to some folks around. <laughs> Huh? The school started no. as a sergeant to the 26th. Wait this year. I know. Why? I don't know. The last couple, like two years ago, it started on the 10th. Like yeah. 10th and 11th. I don't know when that started. But they, like two years ago, As they started. Our grandkids start. Oh, yeah. Start Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. Now this is the 26th. 26th. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was thinking, I thought they always started yeah, a little they earlier. Did. They, than did. they did. They did. The 26th. Wow.
Accidents and people with certain illnesses or patients facing surgery. Sometimes the Red Cross pleads for volunteers to come forward and donate blood because the shortage is becoming a life or death situation and there's a certain kind of donor for which they're looking for. That's because not all blood is the same blood. 
Blood is classified into types, A, B, AB, or O. And each type is either positive or negative, depending on whether it contains a protein called the Rh factor. I know a lot of you know all this, but uh, certain blood types are incompatible with each other and would cause a severe reaction if they were given to the wrong person. That's why the Red Cross is eager to receive donations of type O negative blood because it's compatible with every other type and can be used in anyone who needs it. People with O negative blood are called universal donors. Now spiritually speaking, we are all in a life and death situation because of sin. We each need a universal donor and that's exactly what Jesus Christ was and he became for us at the cross. The blood of the Holy Lamb of God is the only type that can wash away sins. And His blood is sufficient for all sins of all the people for all time. There's never been and there never will be a shortage of supply. Calvary covers us all. Christ's blood is as powerful today as it ever was. If you never accepted His offer, will you allow the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your sin right now. Let's all join together and praise God that our sins are gone forever through the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 Your turn. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank You once again for allowing us to be here in Your presence. We just ask Your blessing now as we're partaking these emblems that represent Your blood and body that was sacrificed for us for forgiveness of sins. It's in Your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have um, elementary and preschool, or I'm sorry, high school, junior high and high school, preschool back this way, elementary downstairs. Good looking. 
working crew this morning. That's all I'm saying. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're most welcome, Bobby. You know, we, we just ain't to encourage you every chance we get. No? <laughs> oh, that's, I could say things I should not. So, yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, it is good to see you. Beautiful morning. And uh, so glad that you are here. Uh, a few announcements to mention and several things for us to pray about. But coming up on the 25th, two weeks from today, will be our hold down, hold down Sunday. We're just going to have uh, some chicken and ham and what bring drinks. You, all the rest of us are to bring, the, I guess, the uh, other side dishes and desserts. And we're going to have a good potluck dinner starting at 530. And then some good friends of mine from over there in Northern Kentucky are going to come. Uh, they play a whole bunch of different instruments. And right here... Uh, in our in our auditorium, we're going to have a have a good country uh, down home singing worship time for about an hour. <clears throat> Hope you come. Invite some people. So we're going to have a great meal, really fun, and uh, it's going to be a, a good evening. The way it's close out the the summertime. I wanted to mention to you our Sunday school challenge. That's going to begin the Sunday after Labor Day. I'll be talking more and more about that. But we're going to encourage you to come to Sunday school for at least six weeks. Just come for six weeks. Because we're going to study, I believe, a really important topic that all of us need to hear. And we're going to discuss and share scriptures and study all about spiritual warfare. We feel it. We see it around us. We see it in our world. And it most certainly affects us each personally, certainly in our families. We need to study this. And we need to study it together to know what each other of us are thinking and how we can feel and how we can teach and help each other. So I hope you come. Okay? Even if you don't regularly come, for six weeks, make a commitment to come. And I believe our time will be really, really worthwhile. And I hope you'll, you'll be here. I uh, saw a bunch of uh, stuff back there in the back. We're going to be loading up for our uh, backpacks for school. It is around the corner. I uh, think we don't begin what? Bracken County begins what? Is it two weeks from tomorrow? Yes. Yeah, the 26th. Do what? Yeah, two weeks from tomorrow. It's the 26th. Two weeks from tomorrow. Okay, so on that Sunday before, uh, we'll have a good prayer time that morning for all of our, our students and all the kids that will be going to school and teachers, administrators, and bus drivers and everybody else who has part of, uh, of a huge school system and uh, a lot of important times. So we want to be praying for them already as they're getting ready. I know uh, uh, this week uh, Brody takes off and he'll be off to college this week. We'll have others that are starting really soon uh, heading off over to Louisville and uh, over to uh, Northern Kentucky there. Uh, I start a week from Monday, Ignite the Norse, our brand new campus ministry, will begin one week from tomorrow. Oh, I can't believe it. Uh, this week we do all the students that will be coming, orientation this week, and uh, Ignite's been do going to be doing a lot of stuff on campus. So uh, it's going to be interesting. After a year and a half of thinking and praying and working, it's uh, almost here. And uh, we're really excited about what's going to, uh, to occur. And uh, a lot of other people are looking forward too, which makes it even that much more exciting. So please pray along with us for all of our students that even begin this week and be taken off, as well as uh, Big Fall in front of us and, uh, and all that. Men's Fellowship is coming up. Uh, we're going to have a trunk or treat there in October. And then the holidays, so we got a busy, busy fall uh, in front of us as a church. But good to have you here today. A few prayer needs. Uh, let me mention several on here. Bertie Lou, of course, on an ongoing, ongoing basis. Roberta, good to have you here today. Want to pray for her family of Glenn Bess, for Vicky and, and the whole family. We certainly want to pray for the family of Kevin Doyle. Uh, of course, for Mindy and, and the whole family. Carter Berkeley is off doing his thing, eventually headed off to Hawaii, but uh, uh, busy busy life, and uh, pray, pray for him. Adi Kiel, 
uh, even praying that he could somehow make it here. Uh, he's asked me to pray, and I said I would mention it to all of you, that somehow they have begun giving a, some visas to citizens to be able to visit different places of the world. And as a missionary, it would be vital, really important, that we could get him here for the, in the United States for two or three months to visit the different places as well as new places. And so uh, we can certainly be asking God for, for that. Roxana Fuchs. And so a lot of things going on, I know, as always, with a lot of people. Other prayer needs this morning? Any at all? I have two. Yes, ma'am. Uh, there are ladies that I've worked with that are both dealing with cancer. One is Shy Rose, and the other one is Jessica Hazler. Rose and Jessica. We'll be praying for them. Thank you. Yeah, those are our stuff. And again, reminding you, anytime you want, if you want to add somebody to our prayer list, write that down for me. That way I'll have the real name and, and spell it right and everything. And then we'll certainly add them to our list and we can be praying on a regular basis. Um, pray for our country. Yeah. Pray for Israel right now. Yeah. Our army surrounding that. <clears throat> yeah. A lot of things. Um, Crazy in the world. Family members in line need spiritual sermon. Pray for salvation. Yeah. All right. Thank you for mentioning that because we probably all do. Yeah. We all have people that we need to pray for in our own families who need to hear about Christ. Other needs this morning? Well, let's pray for each other. Encourage each other. Think of people in your life who need encouragement, who need prayer. Maybe this very morning, this very day, God will hear us. It makes a difference. It impacts people's lives right here and now. And uh, that's why this time is always so very important. Just to remember all this that we do here is uh, not just putting in our time, but it's connecting with Almighty God to make a difference in our lives and as we pray even for other people. Let's pray. We come to You, Father, this morning grateful that You're our God who knows all that is going on within us. I am thankful You do know. We cannot hide anything from You. And so, Father, You're a God of truth and You're a God, Father, who knows what we need. And by Your grace and mercy and power, You can meet those needs. Father, we pray for those who have been mentioned here this morning. We come together in Your name before Your throne, knowing You have the power to make a difference in uh, these ladies' lives who are facing cancer. For our government, for elections, for our military, around the world, especially Israel. Father, we ask for wisdom. Father, I pray for our students that are heading back to school even this week. Safe journeys to where they are going, that their studies would be valuable to them as it would continue to inform them, but to grow them. I pray they will be a strong witness where they are to lots of people wherever they are because they know Jesus and there are many who they will meet who do not. So Father, I pray You'll use them and I pray You'll protect them. And Lord, I'm thankful for the people in our church family who cannot be here today. Several of our shut-ins and they would love to be here but cannot. I pray they will feel Your presence this morning even as we're praying for them that we can find ways to encourage them to help them know they are not alone. And Father, we mostly just thank You for Jesus. If there's people we don't know about, there's people we haven't thought about, but Lord, You have. And You are the only one who can truly change them and build them up to heal them. To help them have a, a brighter 
outlook on who they are and all that's going on in their lives. And, and Father, in this crazy world, we so desperately need an anchor. Somebody we can hold to that will not change, that will always be the same, who will give to us the hope we, we need to carry on. So I'm thankful that we are meeting right here at this church this very morning to give you honor and praise for all that you are and all that you do. We are very thankful. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is something very, very special about Simon Peter. He is the favorite Bible character of many, perhaps because he achieved so much with so little. Peter began as a humble fisherman, and yet he was the first one to walk on water. He was the first disciple to correctly identify Jesus as the Son of God. He was the first one to enter into the empty tomb. He preached the first gospel sermon. Peter was primary speaker for the 20,000 member church there in Jerusalem. Peter wrote two books of the Bible. Peter, Peter was an ordinary man who most certainly accomplished extraordinary things. But I expect Peter is popular among a lot of people as we study, not because of his successes, but because of his failures. Peter blew it big time over and over and over. And because of that, ah, every one of us here this morning can relate because we've all tried really hard and yet at times we've blown it. He was walking on the water one moment, but in the very next he took his eyes off Jesus. He was about to drown in the doubt of what Jesus could do. Peter had the courage to attack the soldier as they came out of Gethsemane with a sword, cut his ear off, but that Peter was the same one not too long after that who denied Jesus three times, one time right in front of a little girl. He denied him. And yet Peter we see is having this great faith. We identify with Peter, I think, because we are not perfect either. We like people like Peter because this is the way we are. Stephen Brown says a woman in his congregation came up to him and she said, Preacher, I really like you. We've had other preachers who say they are sinful, but you're the first one I believed. <laughs> Peter inspires us because we believe that God can use someone like him, but he most certainly can use someone like us. That is so very encouraging. So over the next several weeks, we're going to focus on this great man, Peter, and how God used him in so many different people's lives. I think what's going to be really fun about the study is that you and I are going to relate to this guy in ways that we haven't even thought of in a while. And then we're going to see how God works in Peter's life and going to make the application of how God works in our lives too. Oh, he's going to give to us successes and we're going to be excited about those. And we can see God and we'll praise Him for that. It's great what God has done. But in those moments of failure and disappointment, we're going to see God right in the middle of that as well. That's where He was with Peter. And I am so encouraged to know that God will be with us there too. That's what it's all about. I want us to begin today with Simon Peter's dramatic call to ministry. This story is found in all four gospel books. Four different times they tell us about the call of Peter. His call is dramatic, but not because it was surrounded by some glitz and miracles, but because of the change in his life. I want you to know this morning, this is what God does best. Of everything God does, even the things we prayed about this very morning, what God does best is He changes our lives. Even when the world will suck us away, push us into other corners, it's our God who will pull us back to Himself. And He can change us. And in that we have a hope for our future. 
Peter's spiritual journey began with a very simple invitation from his brother, Andrew. Andrew had met Jesus just the day before. They had followed Jesus. And so Jesus asked them, so what do you want? Because they were just kind of tagging along and following after Jesus. And they say, Rabbi, we just wonder where you live. We just didn't see you having a home. Where do you actually live? And Jesus said, come and see. Just come with me and you'll see. And Andrew, the Bible tells us, spent the biggest part of the day with Jesus. And you imagine spending a day with Jesus. Well, that's what Andrew did. And he says that when he finished that day with Jesus, he couldn't stand it. He just couldn't stand it anymore. And he says that he ran to his brother Cephas and he wanted to tell him, you have got to come see this man named Jesus. He is the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Come and see. Have you found in your experience that the hardest people to win to Christ, maybe even the hardest people that you have to share the gospel with, are people in your own families? Maybe people who are the closest to you, even really good friends? You, you know, I think that is difficult because, you see, they know what we're really like. And then all of a sudden, we're trying to share with them about somebody who's working in our life. That's why it's so important that we're able to show to people not what we were, but who we are and what Christ has done in our lives. We're not that anymore. I'm this. Well, that was Andrew, but he was so excited, he had to go share, and that's exactly what he did. I've thought about my testimony. And there are people right here this morning, you have some great testimonies to share of what you were and who you are now. I remember growing up and hearing some dramatic testimonies of what people had done in their lives, of horrible way of living. But Jesus came in, flipped their life around, and they have changed. And I would go, well, how dramatic. But I kept thinking about myself that I uh, didn't have much of a story. You ever thought about that in your life? You know, I just grew up in church, and uh, Mom and Dad always took me to church. From my earliest days, I heard about Jesus, and I don't know, that doesn't seem very exciting. Sometimes I felt like the man who prayed, Lord, I've never been on drugs, never embezzled any money, never murdered anyone, and I've never been a prostitute, but if you can use me in spite of these inadequacies, please do so. Now, some of you, again, have dramatic testimonies. Could be just like Simon Peter's story. And maybe you're the very one who is being called and urged even on this very day to take the gospel that is inside of you and take it to a family member so they too can hear about Jesus. But have you noticed how God uses simple invitations to transform lives. Andrew just invited people. Uh, Peter. He just simply said, come and see. You know, I'm not going to tell you all about Jesus. Why don't you just come and see who He is for yourself? And His life was never the same. I want you to understand this morning, you and I have some great opportunities for some great Christian activities even this very fall. And I want you to know about them. These are not just for us to have our own little club and all of us to have our own little fun time here at church. There's nothing wrong with encouraging each other. That's great. But it's got to be more than that. Coming up, we're going to have the, you know, the hold down Sunday. Invite somebody to come. Come and see. Come with me. You never know how God's going to work in somebody's life just because you got them to come as we share about Jesus. The men's fellowship is going to be, guys, who, what friend of yours or somebody, other man in your life you could invite to come to the men's fellowship? 
We're going to have our night where we're going to have the trunk or treat. We're all going to be able to be involved in that night. It's going to be stuff for kids and for adults. What about inviting some other family, next door neighbors, even other relatives that you have? Come that night. You never know how Jesus will impact someone's life when we simply say, come and see. Just come with me. And it'll be great. That's exactly what Andrew did. What a great example he is for all of us. So let me just ask you, when was the last time you invited anyone to anything here at our church? I'm not saying you haven't. I'm just saying when was the last time you did so? You pray? You go with enthusiasm? You ask them to come. What an easy way for us to reach out to our family. An easy way to reach out to friends and neighbors and to this community by simply saying, why don't you come and see? It could change someone's life. It most certainly could. Because the power of God will be here. My entire direction in life was changed when my home preacher invited me to preach. My very first sermon. I was 21 years old. I had no idea what would happen that day. He just invited me to preach. Would you be willing to do that? I think I surprised him when I said yes. And little did I know what it would lead to. In the early 1980s, I was invited by some friends of mine to go to Mexico and to visit a missionary where we potentially could have our very first mission trip outside of the United States at our church up there in Indianapolis. And I went. Little did I know that that would be a vision that God would put inside of me. And He did so that very first trip it was even in the very first day or two I was there. I knew I was supposed to be there. I was excited about what was going on. Little did I know that I would be leading over the next 40 years over 2,000 people on mission trips to every continent except Antarctica. <laughs> over 40 countries. I never believed that was possible for me. I had never even seen the ocean until I was 21. I had been nowhere. And I thought something like that was never for me. But God used me. We can make a dramatic difference in people's future and maybe their eternity simply by inviting them to participate. To come and see. But here's the thing. With all the opportunities at this church, if you go a year without inviting someone to come, then I think it's safe to say we've dropped the ball. We've just dropped the ball. We haven't done what we should. You can get turned around on occasions, but you also play a key role in inviting someone to Jesus Christ that most certainly can impact them eternally. In John 6, Andrew brought a little boy. You remember the story. Five loaves, two fish. But with that lunch, Jesus fed the multitude. In John 12, some Greeks came to, to uh, uh, Peter and or to Andrew and they asked him, can we meet Jesus? And Andrew took them. But the one I think is the very best in the life of Andrew is that when he went to his brother. Can you imagine what Andrew would have felt like when he saw his brother rough and tumble Peter Preach on the day of Pentecost the first gospel sermon. you imagine what Andrew felt like? You can imagine the fulfillment and the excitement because he knew that Peter came to know Jesus simply because he loved his brother and he invited him to come. Well, Jesus immediately began to challenge Peter. He came. And in verse 42 of our passage this morning over there in Luke chapter 5. 
Uh, Jesus looked at Peter and he says, You're Simon. You're son of John. You will be called Cephas. And when translated, it meant Peter. Peter means rock-like, stable, dependable. Challenge Peter, Jesus challenged Peter to see his future potential. He named him not for what he was. He named him for what he could become. It is so true in our lives very often. It's so easy for people, and I know in a lot of counseling situations, we have to deal with the past. And the reason is that people live there, see themselves only within the context of their past. I want you to understand something very different about being a Christian. Because that's not how Jesus sees you. He does not see you in the past. He sees your potential in the future. The world doesn't do that, but Jesus does. He doesn't see you for the past. He sees you for what can happen in the future. He sees what's already inside of you, even if you can't see it. If you don't believe it, it's there. He created you to do some great things, to make an impact for other people. And He put that in you. And He sees you for your future. I thought this week, so if Jesus would call you and give you a name, a new name, that would represent who you are for the future, what kind of name would He give you? What would be your name, you think? I wrote down leader, purity, integrity, servant. Again, He doesn't call us and name us for what was in our past, but what we can become in our future. And we ought to be doing the same as Jesus. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Here's another good question of the morning. How many people have you encouraged in your life this past week? Are you an encourager? You see, Jesus wanted to encourage Peter to see what could happen in his life. He used Andrew to do that. Who have you encouraged? Who have you believed in? Who have you focused on? Who have you prayed for? Somebody said, flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not listen to you. But encourage me and I will never forget you. Hebrews 3.13 Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that some of you may be uh, be warned and not harmed by sin's deceitfulness. Jesus challenged people by encouraging them to understand their positive potential of their future. Jesus also, also showed to Peter his transforming power. He showed Pe uh, Peter the power of God that was real. He needed to see it to know it was going to happen. In Luke 5, we have a story of Jesus teaching by the Sea of Gennesaret. And he asked Peter if he could use his boat as a platform. There were a huge crowd that had gathered. And there was no other place for him to get. It was all flat, you know, around the lake. So he goes out onto the boat, and Jesus preaches from the boat so they could hear him, so they could see him. After he finished his sermon, the Bible tells us that he tells Peter, Peter, I tell you what to do, if you would, take your boat, let's go further out into the lake and cast out your nets. Peter looked at Jesus and said, well, Jesus, we've been fishing all day long, man. We've not caught anything. You know, it won't do any good for us to go back out into the lake. But it says that Peter was thinking, well, just to show respect for Jesus uh, all right, you know, hey, I'm the professional fisherman. You're a carpenter. But all right, I'll listen to you. We'll go on out. We'll do as you ask. And of course, you know the story. What happened? There was so much fish that the nets broke. They called for another boat. And when Peter saw this, he fell at the feet of Jesus. And he had a very interesting reaction. He said, 
Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. That's how Peter reacted to the breaking of the nets of the fish and to seeing the power of God for real right in front of him. Notice people, Peter realized how much Jesus power Jesus had and his first reaction was to feel unworthy. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you begin to realize how sinful you really are. If Jesus doesn't seem this morning as a big deal, then it just shows how far you are from Him. If you're here this morning and you think you're a pretty good person, that you're kind of deserving of stuff, it just shows how far you are from Jesus. If you think you can make it in this world without church, without other Christians, without the worship of Jesus, it just proves how far you are from God. When we come face to face with the reality of Jesus Christ, our first reaction must be to fall before Him, proclaim our unworthiness, and repent, and repent because He is the only one worthy of our worship. You see, God formed you. Sin deformed you. But Jesus wants to transform you. You see, our God wants the best for you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. He wants the very best for you. No matter what has happened in the past, He wants to take you right where you are today, and He wants the very best for you. He wants to rescue people from addictions, he wants to give a life back to marriages. He wants to heal the brokenhearted. He wants to take the pressures of life from you. He won't do it in an instant, but over time, He will make, He is the only one who will make a difference in your life. It is a turning to Jesus. John 1.12 reads, As many as received Him, to them He gave them the power to become the sons of God. So Jesus challenged Peter by challenging him to see their positive potential in the future. By demonstrating His transforming power. I want you to see one more thing. When Peter was called to follow after Jesus, he offered Peter the challenge of a higher purpose. Luke 5.10 reads, Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you are going to catch men. Peter's entire life had been focused on one thing, doing one thing every single day. Catching fish. That's what Peter knew. He knew how to catch fish, at least most of the time. But Jesus said to Peter, Peter, if you'll follow me, I'm going to make you into a fisher of men. We want to enlist people into the kingdom of God. The stakes will be high. Eternal life. The demands will be greater. It will not be an you know, 8 to 5 profession. It's going to be a lifelong obsession. The risks are going to be very intense. You are going to have to risk your life. Jesus already knew. Peter, if you follow me, you are going to die a horrible death. That's what he told him. And I believe that's our call today. I hear, I thought about this so much this week. We live our lives today in so much fear. Fear of what this country is doing and what that country is doing. Oh, the Bible says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and there always will be. I'm not saying there are no consequence. I'm just saying there's not going to be a time where they're going to go away. That's what the Bible says. And is the worry of so many people, even about the upcoming election, I don't want to really talk about that, except to say, is where is God in all of this? Nobody 
ever in the history of the world has ever been in a position of government and power unless God ordained them to be so. Good or bad. God ordains them to be in that position. Go read the book of Romans. You'll know what I just said is completely true. And yet we worry about this and we worry about that. And I'm not saying we don't have concerns and we don't try to do the right things. What I'm saying is that as we look into our future and we look at a challenge of a higher purpose, we have a greater purpose than all of that. You and I have been called to be a fisher of men. To show people what it's like to live for Jesus Christ. You see, everything else we've talked about can be very temporary. What we're talking about, and we need to remind ourselves, this is about eternity. Eternity. Eternal things. Much more important. There were several athletes this past week. Over and over. This past week in the Olympics. Did you hear them talk about? Hey, I want a gold medal. So what? I do this for the glory of God. It didn't matter. It comes and goes and nobody will remember my name even. But I hope we all remember the glory of God. They understand something that the world does not understand. And so do you and I. We understand that. I do this for Him. We live for for a higher purpose. We do greater things than just what the world is going to do. It's going to be here, it's going to be gone. And nobody will remember and nobody will care. But what we do for Jesus will last. What we do is so very important because our focus is on eternity. Bill Russell, the great basketball player years ago for the Boston Celtics, said that he was playing a game. He was in the middle of a huddle on a crucial game. He said it was toward the end of his career. He said, suddenly, it all seemed pretty silly to me. Here I was, a middle-aged man, standing in front of 10,000 people in my shorts. And he said, these people are going crazy if we put this round ball through a wire rim. He said, I stood in the middle of those guys and I started to giggle. And he said, I knew then it was time for me to retire. Your whole life can be focused on the things of this world that in 50 years from now, 100 years from now, will not matter at all to anyone. Did you ever think about that? It is significant of what we do as we stand one day before God. Every one of us needs something upon which we can invest our lives that is worthy of our lives. Of how important our lives really are and we do something that matters. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Folks, if this is true, if sin has alienated us from the Creator, and we are hopefully, uh, hopelessly lost, and the Bible says it is. If it is true that Jesus' death on Calvary, Calvary forgives our sins, and the Bible says it is, and it's really true that we, by accepting Jesus as Savior, have our sins forgiven, and we conquer death and live forever with Him, and the Bible says that it is, then this call of Jesus Christ to follow Him and be a fisher of men is without question the most important issue in all of life. Tony Campola said, My goal is to go to heaven when I die and take as many people with me as I can. Here's the question. Who are you taking to heaven with you? Who are you taking to heaven with you? Good question. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Jesus said to Simon, instead of fishing for fish, I want you to fish for men. Look at Simon's response. First, chapter 5, verse 11, he says, So they pulled their boats out on the shore and left everything and followed him. Just like that. 
They knew who Jesus was. There were no more questions to be asked. And they followed Him. And Peter asked, Lord, we've left everything to follow You. What will there be for us? And Jesus said, whoever leaves homes and fields will receive 100 times as much and will inherit eternal life. Here's what I've learned. You cannot outgive God. I think Peter learned this too. Peter understood the deep truths of God. He was the first in the empty tomb. He preached the first gospel sermon. He led thousands to Jesus. He miraculously was delivered from prison. And now, best of all, now he's in heaven. This is what Peter learned, and I think this is what we need to learn more than anything else. He thought he had left everything. He thought he had sacrificed the best part of his life to follow Jesus, but he only learned that life began when he met Jesus. When you come face to face with the real Jesus, that is when your life begins. That is when you understand that life with Christ matters and He would gain more than He could ever have dreamed. You see, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So Peter followed Jesus. He gave his whole life. And he followed the Christ. How about you today? How about you? Our closing song for this series is, I thought through it this week, I always think this is important because I wanted to kind of tie together the different things I'm going to share. It's on page 343. We know the song well. And here's why I chose this song. The song is Amazing Grace. Because I kept thinking, what did Peter think about more than anything else through all that he went through? Crucified upside down, finding himself one day though face to face with God, knowing the life that he had lived, but God had saved him anyway. He just said, oh my goodness, the amazing grace of Jesus. That's what he believed in. And he lived by. And I pray we do too. Stand with me. Let's sing this great old song. on our lives. I'm thankful for people in our lives who loved us enough to share with us Jesus. Maybe they were the ones who just invited us to come as a child, as a teenager, maybe as an adult. And we came. I'm thankful, Father, that You are ever present in our lives, not just here, but every day. And I'm thankful for the call that you've placed upon us to follow you. Because following you at the end of the day matters more than everything else put together. Lord, I thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for your heart of love for all of us as you gave to us your only begotten son. And so we have come here this day to think of you to be thankful to you for the salvation we have 
the hope that we have. The promise of an eternity that we have because of You. Lord, may we live like uh, just confident believers this week, unashamed of the Gospel, unashamed of, of what You have done, and even the name we put on ourselves, <clears throat> the name of Christian. We follow You. I pray, Father, in love and truth, we show that to our world. And we pray in the name of Your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.